Welcome to this exploration that we're doing about the philosophy of objectivism. Today, uh, I am with the famous Yaron Brook. Most of you know him as one of the most uh, visual uh, personalities of the philosophy of objectivism, and he also hosts the Yaron Brook show, and he's a board member of the Anran Institute. And also with us is Professor Tara Smith. She teaches philosophy in the University of Texas, and she's also a member of the Anran Institute. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having us. Um, so one of the things that I see in the world, not only in America, also in Latin America, is the misconception of what is philosophy and what is politics. So I would like to start by having the definition, according to objectivism, of politics. Is politics part of philosophy? Is it a completely different thing? How can one relate to both? Does a politician need to have a philosophy? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, on a few fronts. Um, within philosophy, definitely a very important component is thinking about how human beings should live in society with others, in organized society. And that's what traditionally has been called politics or political philosophy. But politics in that sense isn't just the same as the kind of everyday following of elections or political parties or who's up in the polls or that kind of thing. But Philosophy, and political philosophy in particular, is concerned with what are the basic conditions in a society that will allow the individuals to flourish in that society. So what sorts of principles should govern? You know, should they be free? Should they be compelled to act in this way or in that way? Does man have rights? You know, is there such a thing as an individual right? If so, how do you figure out what your rights are too? What is justice? In society. So there are all sorts of political ideals that people have talked about over the years. People talk about equality in the political realm or democracy and so on. So the, the sort of subject matter of political philosophy is to figure out which of these principles are valid, exactly what they mean, what are their foundations. And then even when we think about just politicians today, you know, in Mexico, in Guatemala, in the US, in Poland. If they're to be, the, you know, if they want to be the elected governors or if they're the self-appointed governors, the governors in society need to themselves be guided by the right ideas about the basics. So you're going to have to stop me sometimes because so, I could go on and on and on. So feel, feel free. Yeah, I mean, it, it, ph philosophy deals with the fundamental questions in, 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 in these fields and in politics it deals with these kind of fundamental questions that, that Tara spoke about. And in a sense, every human being needs a philosophy. Every human being has to have philosophy, but, but somebody who is in politics who has the responsibility of, of determining the laws, of governing, in a sense, it's, it's incumbent upon them more than anyone else. It's the, it, it should be part of their responsibility to have a clear philosophy, to have clear principles, to be able to articulate what those principles are mm -hmm. so that people know what they're voting for. Right. You know, too many politicians today don't have a philosophy, don't have principles, and you don't know what you're going to get. You're voting yeah. for them, but they might change their mind here, and they might change their mind there, they might do this, they might right. do that. And you've got to think about, I mean, the power that politicians or public office holders hold, their power is tremendous, right? They have the power of the gun. They're the people in society who may force you to do things, whether or not you want to, right? Now, that's legitimate for certain purposes, but only for certain purposes. So it's really important that they be thoughtful in the deepest way about when is it legitimate for the government to use coercion? Mm -hmm. what, you know, what kinds of laws are compatible with the whole reason we have government in the first place and so on? So they've really got to think it all through, yeah. Now, it seems to me that there are two forces struggling against each other. There's the sports of politics, which is all about like winning elections, who's the more charismatic, who's the one that kisses more babies or that compels more to like the, the, the causes that are in fashion. And that's like watching, I don't know, like a, a soccer uh, a World Cup. We call it the sort of horse race you in know, the, the US. Horse we race. use that term a lot. Yeah. Right. Who's up, who's down, who's ahead. Exactly. And, and some cute. people... Yeah, exactly, and some people think that that is all that it's politics about right. and that's yeah. what they get bored about yeah. it. Yeah. But also, in that realm of like the, the horse race, the, the sports of politics, political advisors, campaign managers, tell the politicians, 
don't compromise with anything. Don't say that you are uh, in, uh, pro something or against something, especially during a campaign time. So it seems to me that there are two forces that are struggling in politics, right? One is like what we call like the sports of politics or, or the race horse. Mm. That it's all about who's up, who's down, who's winning the election, who's more charismatic, who kisses more babies, who mm -hmm. goes to more rallies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people think that that, that, that is all that mm -hmm. politics is about. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the philosophy that we were, mm -hmm. you know, like discussing the, the important things, what right. is justice, what is yeah. not. And, and these forces are struggling because you have campaign managers or political advisors telling candidates, don't commit to anything. Don't say that you are pro something or against something, especially during the racing campaign. Right, because you don't want to alienate any voters. Exactly, voters, you right. want them all, right? right. And, and if you right. are in this loose end, yeah. in, in, in that in that middle grade. Everybody can like you if you stand for nothing. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, and then, there is the important things of society. If you don't have politicians that actually stand for something, mm -hmm. your society is, is, is not going to flourish, it's not going to prosper. Well, it's just adrift with the particular whims. That, okay, so then this one got elected, who was cuter than the other one, and well, whatever he feels like doing is what will happen. And I, I think, sadly, politics has deteriorated deteriorated to that level such that the people who think, well, if that's all there is to it, that's boring, or I can watch sports themselves rather than politics, right? But it's because, I mean, voters have a responsibility too, to hold candidates and officials accountable to, well, tell me what you, you stand for and why you stand for it. You know, take a stand. We need to push them to take for stands. But people have also just lost an understanding of what government's all about. They don't understand what government is. You know, I was saying a minute ago, let's think about the power, the special, unique power we've given government, right? And think about what it's for. I think a lot of people, and I don't think this is just in the US, government, oh, it's that big institution that does a lot of stuff, or that takes care of us, you know, or the stuff we do together. I mean, you, if you actually will read some politicians included giving the most abysmal, vague, hazy under conceptions of what's, what government is. So when people don't have a sense of what it's for, the kind of power that governments wield, then it's like, eh, and they're all the same because they're not taking stands, right? Then you get this kind of mishmash in the middle of nothing, but in the meantime, power is aggregating in the hands, and then they get the power, and they're not shy about committing then, committing the troops, changing the laws, cutting off the immigration, or whatever. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, in, 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 to a large extent, we get the politicians the culture deserves. So, so it's easy to blame the politicians because they're out there and doing what they're doing. But really, the fault is with the people who that's what appeals to them. They, they want politicians that are handing out the candy, that are handing out the goodies, that don't commit to anything, that are not principled. And, it, and indeed, politicians who stand for anything don't get elected. So the political consultants... It's not their fault. They're just telling you this is how you've got to win. This is the market, right? Yeah, now. this is the market. So if you're gonna if you're gonna make a change, the change has to happen at the intellectual level. We have to gain as a culture, in a sense, an understanding of what government is for, yeah. what government is not for, what kind of politicians, what kind of government actually creates a flourishing society. And as long as people are ignorant or evading the truth about that. We're going to get the politicians that appeal to the, to the worst element of us. And of course, you could have a politician who leads, who educates, who teaches us. But that is very hard, and it's, and it's doubtful hard. that they'd yeah. win. But it also it tells us something about the nature of the politicians who will follow yes. such advice. Yes. OK, yes. I will be all things to yes. all people. So what is he after? Does he have some ideas? Does he have some genuine ideas that he bloody cares about? A philosophy. About, on whatever the issue, and I might disagree with him a lot, no. But it's, well, he's obviously all about getting elected, which means he wants power. power. He wants, I want office so I can do my stuff. Right. When we go along with that, again, we get some of the blame too, but the, we've been doing that for so long at all levels. Every, you know, the consultants are evading, the politicians themselves, the voters are evading. This is a really sacred responsibility to have, you know, such, and again, think about the purpose of government. I think that's one of the things that Ayn Rand stresses that's so important. You've got to think about, why does it make sense for human beings to have a government in the first place? Does it make sense? If so, why and for what? And the basic answer is to protect the individual's freedom to lead their own lives. That is... 
That is what I want to I wanna discuss, because if you do the intellectual work, you end in the conclusion that the government is not to control the economy or have natural resources or nothing like that. Government is to implement the, the, the minimum uh, laws that, per, that allow a just society yeah. to exist to where every individual can flourish, yeah. where your life, your liberty, your private property is respected. Right, it, and if as it's, yours. As yeah. yours, yeah. exactly. Okay, so that's here. Now, on the other side of the spectrum is all the, the, the collectivist mentality of people who believe that the government is actually there to be this... Um, Economic sugar daddy, you know, <laughs> that is there to give you. Well, not uh, just an economic sugar stamps. daddy, but also a moral sugar daddy, right? It's there to right. tell you what you can consume and how you can consume it, with whom you can consume it, you and, and how that. you take your body, and exactly, and, 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 and all of that. So they want control, but really, you said a word there that I think is key. It's the question of what is a just society, and and that's a big part of this is about what is the concept of justice, and, and how does that apply to politics? And I wanted to 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 stress on that because if you ask most of people today, they won't say that the the go the, the government's role is to implement equality under the law. They would say that the government's role is to implement material equality or economic equality. People don't see government as a ruler, they see it as a cash machine. Uh, most Santa of them. Claus, yeah. and, and, and if you try to do the intellectual work, right, and, and try to bring them from this end to this end, they will say, well, why can't we have a mix? Okay, I understand that the law is important, but I also think that economics and the government, you know, controlling economics is important. And I always remember Anne Rand's interview in Playboy magazine in 1964, when they asked her, it seems to me that you see the world in black and white. And she gives a marvelous explanation where she says, well, if you understand that white is right and black is evil, <laughs> why would you go for gray? Why would you put a little bit of, of, of the poison, wrong right. poison the right? Right, in the milk you give the baby. Yeah, or, yeah. no, it, it, it's, it's so true. I mean, you have to figure out what are the right principles for government, right? What is government for? And then it's got to stick to its mission, right? What's the, the function of government? The re government's reason for being, its purpose, right? That's sort of question number one. And if it's to protect individual rights, it's not to protect individual rights and do a little of this and a little of that and all of this other stuff that is, you know, things that are themselves incompatible with respecting those rights. If you're really serious about rights, you can't take from Peter to give to Paul. Exactly. You can't give to the other guy. And so you can't protect individual rights by violating individual rights. And, and the government today is the biggest violator of rights. And the, and the founders of the United States understood this. They understood the risk that the government would, as it accumulated power, start violating rights. And they try to structure government through constitu a constitution, through the separation of powers, that would minimize the risk of that happening. But we don't have, other than Ayn Rand, we really don't have a philosophical defense of the idea of a limited government, of a government that actually only protects individual rights. And that is really what is mi missing from the culture. And we indeed have a mo morality, a moral code that uh, permeates the culture that demands that we take from Paul and give to Peter. Because Peter's suffering, and it's unacceptable that Peter's suffering, and it's okay to use force. So the whole That's philosophical the idea that force is bad, that force is the enemy of reason, that reason is necessary for human survival, that individual rights are a way of protecting our minds, our freedoms, our ability to execute, to, to, to think, and to live based on our minds. That whole philosophical chain is, to a large extent, original to Ayn Rand, and until it is taken seriously, mm -hmm. we won't be able to really transition to a system of government that only protects rights because the pull is always going to be to, but, but what about the needy? Yeah. They, they demand it. And, and oh, we'll use a little bit of force. A little right. bit of force can't I harm I think we've people. got to call out the contradictions there because yes, in right. terms of how you get from here to there, you've just got to, okay, even on the case by case, it's like, all right, you say, well, we've got to give to the... But I thought you were committed to right. You know, first they might get in by saying, oh, yeah, that sounds good, protect individual rights. Well, how is that compatible with, okay, if you don't want to give voluntarily, to hell with you, we're just going to take your money. I mean, 
expose the contradictions and you know try to prod people to look you can't have your cake and eat it too but what what happened because the united states had the foundations for this to be prevented i understand in latin america we've never had that like our legislative system as you explained uh, here in Ocon, Yaron, comes from the continental viewpoint it doesn't come from the anglo-saxon viewpoint of the importance of private property and individual rights so wasn't marx right Maybe capitalism has the seed that self-destroys itself, that after some generations pass and they live Good rich question. and wealthy, they forget how hard it is to get there. So then yeah. you have new generations that say, wait a minute, why don't we just like redistribute wealth? So the challenge with the United States is that it was founded with these fantastic political ideas on a foundation that is equivalent to quicksand. And this is why you can't just pick and choose what you like out of philosophy. Philosophy mm -hmm. is a whole. Mm -hmm. And when you get the politics right, but you get everything else wrong, it's not going to last. And I don't blame the founding fathers for this because they didn't have a complete philosophy. And there was a philosophy and there was no philosophers articulating a, a foundation for liberty. So to a large extent, the Enlightenment, that whole period, has building a... a, a, a beautiful city on quicksand and that quicksand is the morality of altruism it is the lack the fact that they don't have a philosophical complete philosophical defense of reason they don't understand the link between reason fully between reason and individual rights and really the only philosopher who's provided us with the system an integrated system from politics all the way down to metaphysics that integrates it all and provides what i consider you know a real you know, concrete and metal foundation for the so ideas the of capitalism is Ayn Rand. And since the founding fathers came before Ayn Rand, you can't acute blame them for what they did. They did the best that they could with the tools that they had. But it truly is a tragedy that oh, we yeah. didn't have it. Yeah. So I have like a few different things to say here. So first, going back to, to Marx himself, you know, so maybe capitalism, you know, it just spawns its own. We have, even in the U.S., we haven't had full, pure, respected capitalism. So, I mean, Never we had the history. platform set up for it, but we didn't quite do it. And once you start cheating on it, once you start in with the contradictions, the mixed premises, the mixed economy, it's just, the mix is going to grow. The poison is what spreads in the glass. You know, you put a little drop of poison in here, it's going to pollute the, gradually, but eventually and steadily because, well, if he's getting a special favor from the government, I want a special favor. I'm not stupid, right? So once you let in alien premises, that's how it grows and bleeds. But let, I just want to go back let, one no, more. Okay. I, before okay. you go to another sure. point, sure. because this is very important, especially for people that are watching in Latin America, Brazil, uh -huh. Spain. Uh -huh. Sure. Because there's two conceptions, right? The U.S. has always been capitalist. I wish. This, I yeah. wish. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's one. Yeah. yeah. And the other God one of the people so. who, you know, study a little bit more, they say, no, everything, it, it, there was capitalism until the Civil War and the creation of the Fed. Now, you're saying there was never true capitalism. Not fully, completely. And I'm not an economic historian yeah, or no. philosopher. But um, no, we, we always had a mix of some controls, of some gov over government oversight in terms of the currency and so on. Well, and, yeah. and if you think about before the Civil War, we had slavery. Right? Yeah. That's right. not yeah. capitalist. Yeah. That's yeah. anti-capitalist. Yeah. You know, that the, South was, anti the South was feudal. And then after the Civil War, it was a period, uh, the freest we've been. But we had, we had uh, regulation of the railroads. We, we then had antitrust laws in the 1890s. Then we got a Federal Reserve in 1913. But even during that period from the Civil War until World War I or until, until the, the, the Central Bank, we had all kinds of regulations, all kinds of favors, all kinds of cronyism, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Now, it wasn't anywhere near as right. I wish we had what we had back then, right? It was as close as we've ever come to capitalism, and, and it's a million times better than what we have today. But we've never had it in pure form, and we've never had since the founding. There's never been a defense of it. There's never been in, a, a, a intellectuals who actually defended the intellectuals in the 19th century. In a sense, hated the American system, attacked the American system, undermined the American system, certainly post-Civil War. So when the, by the time you get to when you have a central bank and income tax, everybody's ready for it because the intellectuals yeah, have been yeah. pounding yeah. away that this is evil, this is bad. You know, the progressive, what, what, what they called themselves the progressive movement at that time. But European influences, that little poison, Although I think the poison was even there at the founding, slavery, for example, 
But European influences throughout the 19th century undercut yeah. American capitalism from the very and beginning. And going back to what Yaron was saying earlier, it's the altruism, you know, he was saying altruism. the yeah. lack of the moral foundation. It's the altruism that undercut us throughout. I mean, earlier we were talking about individual rights, right? The idea of individual rights, among other things, it means your life is yours. Each man is an end in himself. That is incompatible with my thinking, I am my brother's keeper. I have to serve. Give and you shall receive from the Lord, right? If I really think that, that's exactly what's going to make me think, oh, well, his, he's needy. We have to give to him. So there's that fundamental contradiction between altruism and egoism such that the defenders of capitalism, right? There are many so-called defenders of capitalism. They're, yeah. po they're apologists for capitalism in the sense that they apologize for it. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's not so bad. Or, oh, look at GNP. Or, you know, and they'll point out, but, but, they're not getting at that core issue of egoism, and, altruism, whose life is it? Yeah, and the essential of capitalism is not GMP, GDP. It's not right, wealth. Right. The essential of capitalism is freedom. It's the freedom of the individual to live his life in pursuit of his own happiness. And that, that contradiction is already in the founders. On the one hand, you've got in the Declaration of Independence, each individual has an inalienable right to pursue their own happiness. Right. On the other hand, you've got, you've got Thomas Jefferson and others articulating a morality, a Christian morality, a morality of sacrifice, a morality of what's good for the other is the standard of, of, of morality. And that undercuts immediately the idea of pursuit of happiness. Right. Because is it the pursuit of happiness or is it the pursuit of other people's happiness? What mm -hmm. should actually guide me? And that contradiction in morality then infects the politics. So let's talk about that hypocrisy, that contradiction, because it has been called out by, by different people throughout history. For example, in France, Frédéric Bastiat, uh, a, a lawmaker, well, m mostly an on lawmaker, because he wanted to take away all the laws that prevented, like, true capitalism. A lawbreaker. Capitalism. Well, a lawbreaker. Sense. Yeah. Sense. And he yeah. has a, a very good short story about uh, taxing the sun. Uh, the, 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 the story of the candle makers, right? So he is, is mocking uh, all these crazy subsidies and, and he goes to the extreme of saying, well, why don't you uh, candle makers go to parliament and ask for people to, you know, put uh, wood in their windows and, uh, and, 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 you know, avoid the competition of the most cruel of all the competitors of all, that is the sun. The sun sure. and, and with this, Bastiat mocks you know, the, the fact that this is ridiculous. Also, you have, for example, Friedrich Hayek uh, writing The Road to Serfdom, right? And, and, and warning about the, the dangers of having a totalitarian government mm -hmm. that controls mm -hmm. everything. Also, you have Ludwig von Mises who talk about the anti-capitalist mentality or, or, or the evil within the socialism uh, economic system. So what is so special about Anne Rand? What is that she brings to the table that no one else has brought through history? And I just mentioned three examples, but there have been sure. many other freedom right. fighters. Yeah. But what is it that, that, that she accomplishes that no one else had accomplished before? I mean, I, I, it's basically that she presents a philosophy. If you think of Bastiat, he's fantastic. I mean, he's, he's a genius, but he only deals with a certain layer. He only deals with that political layer. He deals with the law, and he, and he does it beautifully and brilliantly, but he's not challenging, again, the fundamental premises that are in society. It, it, the, 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 the altruism, the lack of understanding of what reason really is, and reason as being man's only, you know, basic, man's mm -hmm. basic means mm -hmm. of survival. Those ideas, you know, he can defend. He's not a philosopher. He's a, he's a in a sense, a legal scholar. If you look at Hayek, I mean, it's interesting to look at Ayn Rand's marginalia comments when she read The Road to Serfdom. I mean, when you read it with that in mind, he compromises all the time. Okay. He is not a principal defender of true liberty. Oh, we need a little bit of welfare. We need a little bit of this. Or we need a central bank sometimes. Or we need this here, this there. Because he doesn't have the conception of an absolutist view of the role of governance to defend individual rights, period. No buts, ifs, nothing. Yeah. And he has this conception, which Rand rejects completely, of the common good, the public interest. Again, coming from altruism, we need to care about society, not about the individual in his own pursuit of happiness, but about what's good for them and the needy. And we need to take care. So, wrote to serfdom, he talks about the slippery slope. He's on the slippery slope. He, put he puts us, there us there on the slippery slope. Right. And even if you think back to somebody like John Stuart Mill, known as a great champion of liberty, 
sort of, kinda, and as long as it serves the public utility, utilitarian, you know. And I think so that's a form in which the, the conflict, the contradiction plays out in the US and always has between the public good understood on these altruists, the good of all, and you know, the individual has to be sacrificed for the greater utility and so on, that versus the individual. And Rand gives you the foundation for understanding. And I like that your own used the word absolute. You know, you have absolute sovereignty over your own life. I mean, all that's got to be unpacked and understood in a certain way, right? But you're, as long as you're not infringing on anybody else's rights, right. your life is yours. And that stands on the egoism, the morality of egoism. And that stands on, again, going back to philosophy more broadly, what she saw in the nature of reality and metaphysics and how we can know anything. But, it, but I mean, isn't that the best for society? Isn't, isn't, the, isn't, well, isn't is the best for society that every individual has their rights respected? Only if like, you understand what society means. Only right if way, you understand yeah. that society is just a collection of individuals. It's not a unit in and of itself. Right? But the fact right. is that most of these thinkers, almost all of them, don't deal with society as, you, as, as, as a collection of individuals. They have a kind of metaphysical view that society is an entity, it's a thing. And, yeah. and, and, and it's okay to sacrifice the minority. If you viewed this, the, the, the individual's life as sacred, then you would never say I can sacrifice one individual for the sake of society. But they all, with the exception of Mises, I think Mises has a better conception here. And he's the best of the economists and he's the most consistent of them. Yeah. I mean, he famously in a Montpellier meeting very early on stood up angrily and said, you're all a bunch of socialists, including Hayek. Yeah. He called him a socialist and yeah. stormed out of the room because they were compromising. Yeah. And, and he would not compromise. And he would call and it he, for and, what it was. And, 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 and he also you, defended Rand, you know? Yes, yeah. he's the one who liked Rand and there's a reason. They were both uncompromising absolutists. But, but let me say, and, you know, I think I, I've come to this more and more. One of the great tragedies of the 20th century, in my view, is that those great thinkers, uh, Hayek, Mises, many of kind of the free market world that was out there, did not take Rand more seriously. If they, these giants, had said, you know, we're economists, and we get the economics, and we can explain the economics, and we can explain the economics of free markets and why it works, but you know what, we're not philosophers. We need a philosopher. And Ayn Rand here is presenting us with a philosophy that gives the foundation for what we believe in. And, sh and, and we, you have to have that philosophical and, uh, yeah, foundation. Yeah. The world would be, we would be 50 years to 100 years further along and in the fight for liberty. Also, not just if they all automatically immediately bought Ayn Rand, but it's like, oh, we ought to look into what she's saying more. And of course, give it a full, thorough, critical, challenge it, yep. et cetera. But you know, like take her seriously to begin with, and you'll see, oh yeah. I agree with that. In, in fact, I come from, the libertarian background first. I studied mm -hmm. Mises, Hayek, mm -hmm. Bastiat, uh, mm -hmm. Hazlitt. It all makes sense. And then I read Rand way after that, reading mm -hmm. Atlas Shrugged, mm -hmm. like I went from zero to everything, you know? And I was like, this is completely coherent. I don't see why which this should be for completely that. coherent. I like both those <laughs> words. Exactly. Yeah. It's like both like both approaches nurture from each other. I don't I, I mean there could be uh, things that as you say, okay, uh, discussions and debates, but that's healthy because that makes a movement grow and have more influence and more impact. But I think but it's because of, of what you said. One of the problems is that economists don't recognize the importance of philosophy. And I think a lot of people out there in the free market movement they get caught up in the economics, and the economics are beautiful, and it's fun, and I, I love it, and, and so on. But unless they start understanding that it all rests on a foundation, and what undercuts freedom in the world today is that philosophical foundation, unless they talk taking philosophy seriously, and uh, engage in objectives, not on the, just on the politics, but as a philosophy, and see its importance in that realm, they can't win. The, 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 the freedom movement can't win. So. Uh, and I think they didn't do that with Rand when Rand was alive, which is a massive tragedy because she was the, the ultimate genius here. But, but that's the kind of engagement that has to happen unless the culture, and this is why it's so hard, unless the culture changes its fundamental philosophical approach, we're not going to get the politics right. Yeah. right? People have to become more egoistic. They have to at least have respect for egoism and respect for their own lives and want the freedom. Right? If people don't want to be free, they're not going to be free. But they should want to, to pursue their values, to achieve their happiness, and, and not have paternalistic government sitting on their shoulder like a mother telling you what you can and cannot do and what to eat and what you can't eat. 
And, but, but they have to have that self-esteem. Right. No, and the nanny state that has been going on for so, so long, that term I think first came out of England maybe, but the nanny state, as it spread, people get used to being taken care of and they want to be taken care of. And uh, I mean, we've all, in a sense, grow up. You know, part of what everybody needs to do, voters, it's like, grow the hell up and take responsibility for your own, you know, but we're, we're in this self-reinforcing kind of yes, cycle. Yes, and, and, and the only way to change that self-reinforcing cycle is philosophy. Is It's a yeah. new set of values. It's a new, it's a new even, way of thinking about the I world. I mean, let me talk about our libertarian friends for a minute, you know, and, and a lot of these economists that we were just talking about, they want limited government. Objectivists want limited government. Limited why? Limited how? Limited by the function of government, by its reason for being in the first place again. Whereas I think what you find with a lot of libertarians is they just want it. They don't really understand what liberty is fully. They don't understand wh wh what its foundations are, why you have a right to freedom, but, but they know that they, they want it. But they really they don't even want it because they don't really know what it is, but they know that they want something. They know that they want to feel a certain way. Hey, don't tread on me, right? Get out of my space. So, yeah, limit government because I, I have these feelings. So it's yeah. completely subjectivist. So that's another way in which I think a lot of the pro-liberty movements, you know, which on the surface look good, really are only superficial and are not getting at the kind of thing that Ayn Rand is talking about. I mean, Hayek rejects the idea really of individual rights. I mean, he's not a defender of individual rights. He might be a defender of economic freedom, right. but not in the name of individual rights. So, in the, but yeah. he does it in the name of, of, of some good. kind of social utility. So at, at the end of the day, he undercuts his own argument. And, and without that understanding of what liberty is, and what is this fun, you know, we keep saying this, but it's so crucial. You can't have, you won't ever achieve. And that while we're at it, let me say, there are two excellent essays by Ayn Rand, which are available free at the Ayn Rand Institute website. One is simply called The Nature of Government, and the other is called Man's Rights. And if you wanted to start thinking more about these things and seeing the way in which she approached them, those two essays, Nature of Government, Man's Rights, available free on the web, just really a wonderful place to start in thinking more about this. Right. I, I feel like I, because they, we, we were talking about this yesterday, the university that I come from in Guatemala gathered together all the, the different uh, minds um, that fight for freedom. So you have a, a public choice uh, school, you have law and economics, you have a monument to Atlas Shrugged. Of course, they, they teach you Austrian economics. And it doesn't matter what you choose in your career. You can study medicine, psychology. I studied international affairs and political science. You have to pass through the courses mm -hmm. of Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. And Rand is always there. Mm -hmm. You know, like when, when the first thing they teach you is great. liberty is responsibility. Is one coin with two sides. You, you cannot have liberty if you're not responsible of, your, of yourself. What you were saying, grow up, right? So I think that I cannot separate what are the benefits that libertarianism has given me from the benefits that objectivism has given me. Like I have both, uh, you know, they are both part of the way that I think, that I conduct my politics, that I try to influence more people. Mm -hmm. And all I see is benefits from the two. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, Rand, for me, she gives me the philosophical aspects on how to conduct my personal character, my mm -hmm. life. What do you say? Why do you want freedom? How mm -hmm. do you answer that question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the depths, like if you see a tree, uh, she's the, the roots. The roots. The roots yeah. um, and then the branches are things like, okay, how are we going to make public policy? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, right. the voucher system in education mm -hmm. or um, individual pension for pensions for, for health. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you, you know, you do the, the pragmatic things, especially in places in Latin America where you have such underdevelopment, you know? So, for, but, but talk, like talking but, with but, you, but again, I understand that I have, this is a unique experience, right? Because most people, either they are objectivists or they are libertarians. And, the, and we are still a minority because uh, the rest of the sure, world sure. loves socialism yeah, and yeah. equality. So, uh, But even at UFM, right, if, if, imagine if they'd reversed their priorities, which would be my preference, but right. not theirs, and started with Ayn Rand and, and built that philosophical foundation and then brought in Mises and Hazlitt and Hayek and, and, and talked about that. Once you have that philosophical foundation, once you built the roots, then you can build the tree. And then you, you study Mises and you say, okay, but... We can't really achieve this instantly. How do we, 
move towards it. Okay, vouchers and this, a means to moving towards liberty. They're not the end, right. they're just right. a means. But, but if you had that philosophical foundation, everything else becomes a thousand times easier. Because if you understand the importance of human reason, the importance of the pursuit of happiness, the importance of individual values, of creating a world in which individuals can pursue their rational values for their own survival and flourishing, then, well, what kind of world is that? Oh, obviously, it's a world in which they get to make choices. That's freedom. That's what we mean by individual rights, by protecting individual rights. Mm -hmm. So capitalism kind of becomes, or freedom becomes kind of simple once you understand this foundation. And then in terms of how does the economics work and how do we move mm -hmm. towards economic freedom? Yeah, it, it, these free market yeah. economists have a lot to right. contribute to yeah. that debate. But first they have but, to acknowledge yeah. the importance of the roots. And I think we've, like, just to go a little further on the roots issue, let's be a little more specific even about something that your own has referred to a few times now, you know, about the, the sort of the foundations for freedom or the nature of reason. Why is freedom such a good thing, all right? I mean, I, I was indicating a few minutes ago, it's not just, hey, I like it, I want it, I don't like when people tread on me. Um, it's a good thing, be, I mean, just, you know, quick version, because human beings need to reason in order to do the things we need to do in order to survive. Right. I mean, this is the most basic, like, we are all human beings as a kind, we are born naked and ignorant, and we don't know what the hell is going on, and we need to figure it out. We're not like animals who have the claws or the fangs or the speed, and they just, you know, are drawn to the foods that, like, no, we need to figure it out. Man survives by his wits. We need to think, of, oh, I can turn that into a hammer. I can, you know, I can plant a few, you know, over the centuries and centuries, right? We, in order to read, so reason is man's means of survival, as Rand stresses, like this major theme in some of her fiction and nonfiction. Reason is how we survive. It's how we get by, let alone how we really flourish and build these fabulous societies and these cameras and so on, right? But in order to be in a position to reason, you need to be free of others, of other individuals forcing you to do thing, you know, initiating the use of force against you. But it's all of that, and again, there's a lot to be said there that needs to be explained and understood so that we understand freedom is an objective value. It's not valuable just because some people like it, right? It, it is objectively valuable to mankind. And when you deprive men of freedom, you're in effect like, you know, you're doing things to their brain or you're making their brains dysfunctional or unable, you're like paralyzing their brains. Now. My God, how sick is that? How cruel is that? How anti-life is that? Right. So every time we then talk about, well, let's mix in a little socialism with the, you know, going back to the poison here again, that's what's going on. Right. You know, no wonder she got angry. Yeah, I mean, think about government regulations. What government regulations are doing is they're limiting the scope of my ability to think. I can't yeah, think outside yeah. of the box. Yeah. So people don't. Right. Or if they do, they get slapped down and they get shut down. So. It's not just that government regulations disturb a market as economists describe it. Much more fundamentally is it's limiting the scope of my thinking. It's constraining my mind. And, and that's, that's why the evil. That's the economies the evil. that have, you know, I mean, let's go back to the Soviet Union. You know, yeah. let's go back behind the Iron Curtain. Let's go, I wish back historically, but unfortunately today to so many countries where well, we see the, the practical effect. This is what I to young people in, in, in Latin America. I say to them, why do you think that Cuba looks like a postcard from the 1950s? Why is it that it's stuck in time? Right. Because even when you say, okay, we're going to distribute everything, you can only distribute what in that moment exists, but since you are forbidding freedom, there's no more liberty for you to, to read, to innovate, to come up with new products. So you get stuck in time mm -hmm. right. because you distribute what exists in one right. time. What the minds came up on. with in 1920 exactly. or whatever. Right? Exactly. You're just stunting the mind, which is stunting life yeah and, and in Cuba Cuba is unique because really what should have happened in Cuba is a complete deterioration they should be living mm -hmm. like 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 in the in the 15th century yeah. not the only reason they even have in the 1950s is because they got money from the USSR for a while they got money for the they suck money in Venezuela yeah. they're sucking money out of Mexico mm -hmm. and all these other regimes that are funding them but if you actually just leave the system alone oh, it, it drops. you see it in Venezuela yeah. you, right, right. You, you see starvation you see complete deterioration to returning man to subsistence farming. You have to go back and start growing your own food because you've destroyed the capacity for civilization. So going going back to the, and, and, and connecting this, you know, like good public policy and the, the, the roots of philosophy, is there any record uh, of Ayn Rand having opinions on Margaret Thatcher and the way she made government? 
I don't know. I just I, don't know. I don't think so. I don't think she knew much about Margaret Thatcher. And, you know, Margaret Thatcher was, of course, a, a mixed case. As, as great as she was in the context of the politicians yeah, we've oh had God, yeah. over the last hundred years. I mean, I wish we had another Margaret Thatcher today. She was a very mixed case. And she, she wasn't completely principled. And she was on that slippery slope. And partially, I think that's because her main guidance came from Hayek and not, not for something even more principled mm -hmm. than that. She did amazing things. I think she's a heroine in, in, in the context of, the, of politics. But, but she, didn't, she didn't go as far as I think we would have liked her to go, particularly in articulating the philosophical case for what she was doing. And so what happened in England and what happened in the United States is you get a, you get a swing yeah. to more freedom, and then for a while there's a certain momentum with that politically, but then everything is swinging backwards. Because, because you didn't lay the philosophical foundations, you didn't lay even the, the, the political foundations for that swing to continue towards more and more freedom. And in some ways freedom. you end up giving good ideas a bad name when under the name of the good ideas you have these half-hearted yes. semi-measures and then everybody thinks, see, we've been there, done that, tried that, doesn't work. But how far can you go when you're in politics? Because uh, I, I recently uh, wrote a book and I inspired myself in both Anne Rand's Conservatism and Obituary, which is included in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and how she uh, blames also conservatives, you know, for, for the oh, yeah, extanation yeah, yeah. of, of yeah, the good absolutely. ideas. Yeah. And then I read Margaret Thatcher and how she said, okay, I knew that the socialists were my enemies every time that I put down a union, but the treason came from my conservative yes. party. Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that were always wanting to compromise. And every time I went too far, they were like, no, you're coming back. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it were not for the Falkland Islands, mm -hmm. that, that crisis she that she managed, lost the election. Mm -hmm. that she would have been removed Absolutely. by the party. Yes. So th where do we make it work like not betraying the principles, but actually getting into office? Because if you go too much to the extreme, you get out, not by your enemies, by your own peers, unless you have the absolute power of, like, you know, I don't know, becoming a, a dictator or, or saying, but like... You know what Mises, says about be, what Mises said about becoming a dictator? So Mises was asked once, what, what would be the first thing? You're you could do anything. You're a dictator of the world. You can do anything you want. What would be the first thing you did? Uh, in my case? No, in, what do you think Mises would I say? don't know. <laughs> Resign. 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 You said you can't, you can't force people to be free. Right. You can't impose freedom on people. You, the, the whole idea of a dictator is a negation of the idea of freedom. Right. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, sanction the right. idea of a dictator by staying a dictator. So no so, Pinochet, for example. Well, oh. yeah, I mean, Pinochet and Pinochet killed a lot of people. He's a bad yeah. guy. I mean, we yeah. have to balance the good with what you actually yeah. did. Yeah. It, so no, no, no Pinochet. And, and this is the challenge, right? And this is why it's a little depressing. But you're not going to really achieve much success in politics. Right. Politics is not the right. realm in which we're going to change the world. Right, I agree. The way to change the world is through education. The way to change the world is, to, is, is through convincing people and, and educating people about a new set of ideas. And again, I keep going back to this, but this is why philosophy is so important. That's, mm -hmm. where, the, the, well, that's where it's so hard to, to educate people, to change people's morality. We talked about it particularly in the context of Latin America which is a very Catholic place. You're gonna have to give up that Catholicism. You're gonna have to give up that morality yeah, of I sacrifice. It's doable, that having been raised a good Catholic, it is <laughs> doable. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but, but unless you give that up, unless you give up the notion right. that the moral ideal is a man dying, not for sins that he committed, but for sins other people committed, right. that's the most unjust thing I can think of, right? I mean, I'm okay with suffering for sins I committed. Mm -hmm. I'm not okay with suffering for sins other people committed. Yeah. That's just wrong. So. We have to change our entire conception of morality. And until we do that, politics, we can change it at the margin. We can, we can do a Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher did a lot of good. I don't, I don't want to minimize right. that. And move the pendulum yeah. to a more free direction. But we're not going to attain freedom and it won't be sustainable right. unless the culture changes. And that means people's philosophy, people's view of ethics primarily changes. Perfect. So what, what should we do in order to, you know, fix society? Can an individual fix it? Or should we do like John Galt did, you know, like start a new society from scratch? Um, I would probably, well, no, we should not go off and start a new society. I think fix it, 
there are things that can be done in many, many societies. It also depends on what kind of society you're right. in and how far gone it is and the nature of who's in power. I mean, there are some big differences still within you know, regions and countries in this world. So not all situations are the same. But um, often, you know, education, not just education of you know, the first graders and the fifth graders, but you know, in, you've got to educate people about ideas, talk to, get them to question, as we were talking about earlier. Get, you know, poke at the contradictions or the tensions in the things that people are saying. You know, poke them to think honestly, to be honest with themselves and each other, and not just repeat the group speak or what we all know are supposed to like the environment or egalitarianism or whatever the trendy ideas are. Like, really try to get to individual minds to just start questioning some of these things because it is it's a long gradual process you can you can make some changes at the margins and by talking about political issues and we need to put out the fires that the politicians are increasing you know because we're affected by those but long range it's got to be a deeper level of people's thinking. Yeah, and for your viewers, change. go read Ayn Rand. I mean, I mean, go oh, read yeah. Ayn Rand and yeah. educate yourself. Before you can educate others, you have to educate yourself. Yeah. Learn about these ideas. Learn about these, these foundational ideas. Understand the economics and the politics of them. And then go out. And, and the best way to educate people is speak, speak, speak. Write, write, write. I mean, what you do, thinking, what the oh, Ayn Rand yeah. Institute is yeah. doing, we're, we're trying to get to young people and trying to get them when they're still open to new ideas, radical ideas. Yeah. And, and, you know, expose yourself to these ideas yeah. first by reading the books. And then I, I can't think of anything better to do than what you're doing, Gloria, which is speaking yeah. about it yeah, and, and, and advocating yeah. for it and having discussions about it. Yeah, I, I think that you can, uh, you know, switch people's uh, way of, of thinking by questioning. I think that that's, that's the, the, the genius of Socrates, right? Like always asking, but keep why? Keep thinking, why? keep why? thinking, keep, keep questioning. Thinking. Right, keep yeah. questioning yourself. Yeah. And this Be is why we need to fight for, for free speech and, and all this ridiculousness yes. of, you know, yes. like, no, you cannot talk about that and that's cultural appropriation and that offends me and oh, no. feelings before thoughts. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. if we don't fight... Uh, or defend the right of, of speaking freely, then game I think... Game over. <laughs> yeah, game over. Yeah. And, and again, even the defense of free speech is, is, a, is, a, is, is philosophical, has to be philosophical, because you said feelings above, above reason. Well, the people who believe feelings should be above reason. They're philosophical arguments for why reason is impotent mm -hmm. and you shouldn't mm -hmm. go by reason, why you're in the collective wisdom and this group identity. All of these things are coming from a philosophical foundation. So even to defend free speech, we need to understand what reason is. We need to understand why it's efficacious. We need to understand it's the only way in which human beings can know stuff, and which again challenges religion. You know, we need a whole philosophy, which again Ayn Rand gives us the foundations for. It gives us she she asks the right questions, and she often gives the right answers, the answers to those issues. So on every one of these issues. Philosophy is where the action is. And, and if we abandon philosophy, if we just do it from a utilitarian perspective, if we just use Mill's argument for exactly. free speech, exactly. we lose. Yeah, and, we that's lose. What's, and that's why the First Amendment, I mean, in the US, you might think, hey, you guys have had a First Amendment for over, you know, it says in your constitution. For, yeah. What's happening that it's so deteriorated there? What's happening is the influence of John Stuart Mill. People, def even defenders of free speech in the US, defend it by its service to civil society so everybody can be educated, so, every, so it can serve the public good again. That's not the fundamental basis for free speech. You know, it's the individual again. Oh, but the individual makes people nervous. Yeah. I don't like the individual because that sounds selfish. And, and, that, so, and, and that's, yes, that's be where selfish. We're gonna get. That's and where we're going to get. Capitalism sounds like, okay, every man for himself. So what about the poor? And also, um, now we have this culture of spending we see it for example in latin america the the kids of the drug dealers or the kids that come from cronists and they have huge amounts of money and it's all about like yachts and jewelry and women and helicopters and you know like like rich kids that are entitled to any material uh, good that they want they don't have any philosophical principle and people say to you you see that is what capitalism is all about, like, like this shallowness of materialism and consumerism. How do we make the, the connection to people that say, no, that is precisely because these people lack 
philosophical basis, they behave like that. There's a difference in between being materialistic and consumerist and, and shallow uh -huh. than being sure. a well, true capitalist. capitalist. I mean, how a person spends his money, why he wants his money, those are moral issues, psychological issues, right? Capitalism is a, a, a political system in which every individual rights are respected. Mm -hmm. What you do with your rights is another kind of question, how you exercise, right? But capitalism is wonderful. Capitalism is the system that takes seriously this idea, your life is yours, each man is an end in himself. If you want to make something, if you want to create some product or service and offer it, you can do that on the free market, and if somebody wants to buy it, great. Why will they buy it when they do want to buy it? Because he thinks, I'm better off spending the money, right? And Gee, that looks good. Like, what's wrong with that? Allowing you to, allowing you to, not getting in your way. Like, you want, you want to make a transaction? Right. You do it because you think you're better off. I want the money, right? He wants the shoes or whatever it is you're selling with the IT right. service, right? So it's mutually beneficial when you truly have capitalism and you haven't distorted it with favors for some or cronyism or all this other garbage, right? When it's true, laissez-faire, let willing, voluntary agreements be made by adults, that's how we get out of the jungle and so, you know. And, and I think it's really crucial, particularly in Latin America, but even in the United States as well, to say we don't live under capitalism. Whatever you're yeah. seeing, whatever behavior this is out there, it. it's not capitalism. People, for example, people who actually earn their money, people actually work hard and, and, and have an idea and, and actually create the wealth, not just steal it like Conan's right. do. Right. They have respect for it. They don't behave yeah, in, in these... I mean, maybe one or two right. of them do, but, but, as a, but, but, but overall, they have real respect for it because they know what it took to earn it. They, they, you know, and you can see that. You can see you know, whatever you think of a Jeff Bezos and a Bill Gates and so on, they're not crazy no. consumer you know, going off on parties and yachts. Yeah. It, it, that just doesn't happen. And indeed, they're still working and they work hard, even though they've got more billions than they'll ever be able to spend. The joy comes from the actual productive yeah, activity. Yeah. The joy comes from making stuff. And the reason they still make money is because that is the measure. That's a sign that they're creating value. Right. Profit, what they're making. Yeah, profit is a sign of value. That's one of the big misunderstandings of capitalism. People, people say, oh, they made so much money. That's bad. I go, if you make a lot of money in, in a free market, that's a sign you created huge amounts of va thing. value. You change people's lives. You change the yeah. world around you. Otherwise, you cannot make money. Yeah. Right. So... It, 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 Partially, we have to disentangle this idea of what capitalism is. It's so crucial. Cronyism, for example, is a feature of statism. Mm -hmm. It's not a feature of capitalism. Capitalism doesn't have cronyism because politicians have no favor to give. So, so there's nothing to lobby for. It's only if you give politicians the power to give favors mm -hmm. do you get cronyism. Mm -hmm. And b uh, in this sense, what is the role of money? Because even people like Harari... Uh, recognize that money is one of the most fantastic technologies and tools that humanity has come up with in order to trade peacefully mm -hmm. with one another mm -hmm. and benefit. So yeah. even people that wouldn't agree with, with a lot of, uh, of, of the things saying, that we've yeah. talked here, they recognize money as one of the best technologies, like language, like well, mathematics. It's a tremendous facilitator, it's a, right? It's a facilitator. Yeah. Should it be in the hands of government exclusively? Well, obviously not. I mean, it, there's, there's absolutely no reason for it. And when government does, it, like it, if it monopolizes any product, it's violating people's rights to use whatever kind of exchange, means of exchange that they want. And indeed, the only reason dollars uh, uh, you know, have values because we have legal tender laws. You have to accept dollars. You uh -huh. can't, yeah. chew, yeah, I can't right. put a sign on my yeah. door that says, I only take gold. That's yeah. actually illegal. You go to jail for that. So violating our rights to trade in whatever we want to trade. And of course, we know all the problems that central banks have created, all the disasters economically yeah. that central banks have created. So it's, it's the practical is the moral, and the moral is the practical. And when you violate rights, you get bad outcomes. And the, 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 the essential violation of rights is our inability to exchange and our inability to exchange what we want to exchange and how we want to do it. And the consequences, the, the inflation, the recessions, the depressions, the, all the things that central, central uh, bankers right. have, have, have wrought against us. 
Yeah, I don't thought uh, I could talk with you for yeah, like days. Yeah, I feel the same way. This is great. <laughs> this, is, this is terrific. <laughs> but unfortunately, we have our past our deadline. Okay, good. <laughs> and the other good thing is that we actually covered all the questions that we Wonderful. have. Wonderful. And even more. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down and Thank explaining you. these things. I think that uh, the way you have answered, you you can tell that you are amazing philosophers because you give great examples that, that people that you know, are not as familiar with these ideas, can relate in their daily lives, and I, and I think that's important. Well, thank, thank you for bringing these ideas to, yeah. uh, to the Latin world. Well, I'm excited you. about You're that. Yeah. Thank you very Good. much. Thanks.